I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand in awe of the Lord tonight, don't you? Amen. I stand in awe of the Lord of what he did this morning. What a, what a blessed time to be in God's house. And, and now we get to do it again. And uh, we just look forward to what God's going to do. Now, I will tell you tonight that if you're on these edges over here and over here, you're going to have a difficult time seeing. Okay? You see that marker board? It's going to go up on the stage tonight by the time Brother Gary preaches. He's going to be using the marker board tonight. So if you're way over here or way over there, Carl, you're going to have to lean hard this way to be able to see. I know we might have revival if you move. If you get up and move, there might be revival. <laughs> He's got the pews gripped over there. By the way, brother, he is the biggest, most avid Crimson Tide fan you would ever meet in your life. We pray he gets saved tonight. Amen? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Let me, uh, let me share with you some quick announcements, and then we're just going to get right into it. Just some reminders. Next Sunday night, the Southern Plainsmen will be here. They will be singing Looking forward to a great time next Sunday night at 6 o'clock. Don't forget about our men's rally. Be purchasing your tickets for the men's and boys' rally that's coming up. Uh, we're looking for over 300 men to be a part of that. And, and uh, so we're, we're praying for a great, uh, great time with that. Our Bible conference coming in March. Be praying for that. Um, and then our Romania, Romania items that are needed. Um, Miss Nancy said make sure to announce fungus cream, <laughs> fungal cream, whatever. She's not in here tonight. Where is she? We're going to have revival tonight. You're not where you're supposed to be. Okay, so fungal cream. Okay, well, that's trouble because if Nancy's over there, it's trouble. Okay, but... Children's vitamins, analgesic creams, antibiotic ointments, and glasses, okay? We've only got a, really two or three weeks to get this collected because we got to start getting them packaged up. We're taking those with us in addition to all the meds that we're going to have on that end that we order on that side. So anyway, uh, help us out with that. Also, tonight when you leave, we will be receiving a love offering for Brother Gary. Now... I, I, I know you were blessed this morning. You're going to be blessed tonight, so let's be a blessing back to his ministry. And it's not just about how uh, Brother Gary has led us today, but it's about his ministry period. The ministry that he has in the United States, the ministry that he has in different places in the world. And so be a part of that. And so if you want to write a check, you write it to the church, and then we're going to turn around and we'll write him a check before he leaves here tonight. And so help out in that regard. We will have uh, people uh, stationed at the doors when you leave. And so you can give um, uh, to that uh, tonight. And I know that you always do a great ministry with that. And uh, pray that you'll continue to do so tonight. Okay. We want to pray especially tonight for Brother Gary. Um, we said this week is his week to get prayed over. And so not just for... Not just for the Bible conference, but you pray for him and Miss Norma. They got a lot of things coming up. Um, they've got a Romania trip coming up. They've got a Israel trip coming up, plus all the preaching that he does. They got a trip uh, to where uh, Paul's all Paul's visits. We got some of uh, our folks are going on that, plus all the ministry that they do. So we want to pray for him tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then Brother Larry is going to come and lead us. Father, thank you so much for what you've already done this day. We give you all the glory and all the praise for the service this morning. Thank you for the decisions that were made. Thank you. That people, many people have shared with me today just how special the time was for them this morning. And how convicting it was. But Lord, help us to go beyond conviction to repentance and really, really allowing you to use what we've already heard today and what we hear tonight to change our lives and to bring revival. Bless Brother Gary, Father. Bless Norma. Thank you for them. Thank you for our friendship through all of these years, Lord. I thank you personally for him. And Lord, I pray that you would bless their ministry and, and greater anointing than ever before. I, Lord God, bless every meeting that he's in. 
bless every group that he takes off into different places in the world to minister and, and to go to these great places to see where you ministered and where you walked and where Paul ministered and so forth. But God, help us to be a blessing to him tonight financially. And uh, God, I, I pray that you would anoint him as he preaches tonight. And then as he preaches again in March when he comes back, that you would use him in a mighty way. Thank you for this time, Father. Bless, bless Brother Larry now as he leads us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together, if you will. We're going to begin singing with a great hymn at the cross. Let's sing together. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Could he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there. And now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. And the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. But drops of grief can never repay the debt of love I owe. Dear Lord, I give. Jesus died. 
sing it out. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy.
come down. Let's sing this chorus that simply says, bless God. Let's sing it. Bless God. I don't know if I've ever preached in front of a whiteboard before, but this will be that time. Uh, we'll use that in a little bit, but uh, first of all, we want to uh, you take your Bibles, turn to very, very familiar scripture that you've heard tons of sermons on, and that is 2 Chronicles 7.14. I want to talk to you about revival tonight, and I want to do it in two different aspects. First of all, we're just going to look briefly at 2 Chronicles 7, 14 to just kind of remind us of some things that we hopefully already know to set the stage for the theology of revival, if you please, the, the biblical plan of revival. 
uh, God's formula for revival or whatever you want to call it. And then in the second part of my time tonight, I want to, I want to deal with the practical aspects of revival. What needs to happen at this place, at Sweetwater Baptist Church, in order for God to really send revival? Whether it be Sweetwater, the church down the road, across the way, another state, around the world, uh, I promise you the things that I'm going to share in the latter part of this time together will never be violated. I'm in my, by the way, uh, June the 4th, I will finish 50 years of preaching the gospel. And uh, that's a long time. And for the last 44 years, I'm finishing my 44th year in, in evangelism. I have never seen the things I'm going to share with you be violated. And so I want you to listen with an attentive ear, but a surrendered and receptive heart. So let's, uh, let's begin reading. And let me ask you to stand as we honor the reading of God's word. Second Chronicles 7, 14. He says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then. In other words, all those other things that we've just read has to happen. He says, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I think we want the latter part of the verse without doing the first part of the verse. That's, that's the plague of the of the church of our day. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that it's, it's true. We can rely upon it. We can place our eternity upon it. And, and God, we're thankful that you allow us to have your word. What a blessing it is. And God, I pray that you might help me as I share tonight to share my heart and share the word of God. Help me not to stand here uh, empty, but fill me with your spirit and, and give me the power of the Holy Spirit tonight to to share the things that your precious people uh, want to hear and hopefully will need to hear. And God, I pray that we might receive it and act upon it and let you send revival to our heart. And I'm thankful, Lord, tonight that as individuals, we can have revival where anybody else does or not because our relationship with you is an individual one. We're saved individually because we sin and you look down and have mercy on us and we can be saved, and likewise, individually, we can have revival in our heart and our life. And Lord, we know that a church can have revival. God, there are pockets of revival going on around our world, but God, it's not nearly enough. We desperately need revival. And Lord, we need something even beyond that. We need a great awakening, another great awakening in our, in our nation, in our country. And so God, I pray tonight that you might prick our hearts, beginning with mine, Lord, because, Lord, in the latter years of my life, in my ministry, I want you to be able to use me. I don't want to be on the shelf. I want to be used until you take me to glory or until Jesus raptures me to heaven. And so, Lord, I pray you'd have your will and way tonight. I plead the blood of Jesus over this service. Declare this sanctuary off limits to the evil one. And thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, for just a... Just a, a a short time. I'm not going to go into great detail on these because of time, but I want to talk to you about the, the formula, God's formula for revival. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is the people, the people who are responsible for revival. What does he say? Notice very clearly what the verse, verse says. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, that's very specific, that's talking about those of us who are redeemed, who are born again, who are children of God. And so the people who are responsible for having revival or allowing revival are the born-again believers in God's church. Now, if you gave me five minutes or you gave me five hours or probably today five days, I could tell you everything wrong with America. Man, I could start in Washington, D.C. and go to Jackson, Mississippi or Baton Rouge, Louisiana and I could talk about politics and I could talk about corruption and, and, and lying and, and all the things that, just, uh, that we've just seen an avalanche of in our country. 
I could tell you everything wrong with America. But folks, revival is not going to come through those kind of people. Revival, if it comes, a great awakening, if it comes, is going to come through my heart and your heart and your church and my church and churches all around this country. As I shared with you this morning, I believe we have a nationwide revival. It's got to start in the local church. I really believe that. Now, a spark can start somewhere else and filter over, but it's got to be in God's church. And so we are the, are the people who are responsible for revival. God's people. I could say so much more about each one of these points, but for the sake of time, because I want to get to the other, because I believe it'll be a blessing to you. You know, we, we get in our prayer meetings and we, we pray, oh, Lord, send a revival. Oh, Lord, send a revival. We don't have to persuade God to send a revival. We just have to permit God to send a revival. That's all. We just have to lie. Him. I promise you God wants a revival more than we want to receive it. Amen. All right, the second thing I want you to notice very briefly not only the people who are responsible for it, but the position that is necessary to have revival. If my people, which are called by my name, shall what? Humble themselves. Humble themselves. Folks, God never blesses a proud believer. God never blesses a proud church. God, the Bible says, God resists the proud, but what? Gives grace to them. We need to be an humble people. We need to be a gracious people. We need to submit ourselves. We, we cannot have revival individually or collectively unless we humble ourselves before God. I love seeing these prayer benches here. There's not many churches I'm in. Sometimes I'll go a whole year and not be in a church that's, that's, that's got a, a, a place to come and kneel and pray or anything like that. In earlier years, I used to see a lot more of those kind of things. But do you, I can tell you from experience that I've been in churches and you ask them to come and kneel and pray, they'll look at you like, who in the world do you think you are asking me to pray, to bow my knee in church and pray? Well, folks, I'm going to tell you, people like that will never be used of God. People like that will never have revival come because God resists the proud. All right, let me move along. The people who are responsible for it is us. The position is a position of humility. And then number three, the prayer that will bring it. If my people, which are called by my name, shall um themselves and what? Pray and seek my face, if they'll pray. We talked some about prayer in the message this morning. I want you to look back in chapter 7. <laughs> uh, I love this verse. Uh, the background of this passage is Solomon was getting ready to dedicate the new temple that had been built. But look at verse 1. Look at it. It says, now when, I mean, I love this. This fires me up. Now when Solomon had made an end of praying. Now, now go back in, in, in chapter 6 and read, read his prayer and all of that. But it says, now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven. Woo! I'd love to see the fire come, wouldn't you? And consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house. Man, that's an exciting verse. And uh, that's what I want to see. I want to see revival break out so bad that no preacher can take credit for it. No church can take credit for it. It'll just be because we as God's people humble ourselves and we allowed God to fill the house of God. And folks, there's nothing sweeter. There's nothing more precious than when the Spirit of God blows across a congregation like this. I mean, it's just, I mean, you don't have any grudges anymore. You don't have any unforgiveness anymore. You've gotten rid of the sin in your heart and your life. And it's just the sweetest, most precious thing in all the world. You love folks that you've never loved before. I mean, it's just, it's just a supernatural act of God. And so the, when we pray fervently, that can happen. And so the prayer that will bring it. And then uh, let, me, let me move along. Not only the prayer that will bring it. Fourthly, no, notice the persistence that characterizes revival. If my people, which are, I know I'm going fast, but I got to. If my people, which are called by my name, shall um themselves and pray and what? Seek my face. Seek my face. That speaks of persistence. That speaks, of a, that speaks of a desire 
That speaks of an inner longing. That speaks of a, a, just a heartfelt surrender to such an extent that God's got to do something. In Matthew 7, 7, Jesus says, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. He said, Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I never will forget, when I played football 100 years ago, it's so much different than it is now. They have guys that play offense, and then they have a whole another bunch that plays defense. When I played, you played both ways. And if, I remember my first year in, in, in junior college, I started on defense, and I alternated on offense. I didn't even feel like I was first team because I wasn't playing the whole game. But I remember in football practice when I was in high school, and they had they'd work us out and they'd run us and we'd get soaking wet in that August heat. That old jersey would be just soaking wet with sweat. They didn't give us water. They didn't give us any water. I've seen guys so thirsty, so thirsty that they'd take that old nasty This would be a good night to go on a diet because I've killed the appetite. <laughs> They'd soak that sweat out of that old jersey, Brother Wilson. And I've seen them literally drink water out of a mud hole. Isn't that yucky? But you know what the greatest desire of that football player was? I want some water. I want some moisture in my system. And it doesn't matter what happens. I'm going to do whatever is necessary to do it. That's what that verse is talking about. We need to have the desire that no excuses, whatever I, whatever I have to do, whatever cost it, 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 it costs me, I'm going to have revival regardless. The persistence that characterizes it. And that's what we need to do. We need to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Let me ask you just parenthetically, how many of you have ever really been hungry and thirsty? None of us, I, I, listen, I, I've, been, I've been fairly thirsty playing ball. But I ain't never really been hungry. There's too much food around. But folks, let me tell you something. We need to hunger and thirst after righteousness. We need to hunger and thirst after righteousness. And when we do that, we can have revival. Let me move along. Number five, I believe, is the problem that necessitates it that is revival why do we need revival if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and what turn from their wicked ways what is wicked ways sin sin my guess is that in this building tonight I I'm speaking to nothing but a bunch of sinners could I be correct? Amen. Can I get an amen on that? We're all sinners. Amen. Some of us are worse sinners than some of the rest of us, but we're all sinners. And the reason we need revival is because even as believers, even as born-again believers, we, we have sin in our, we get sin in our life. Whether it's the sin of omission or commission, whether, whether, whether it's something we did that we ought not to do or something we ought to do that we didn't do, we have sin in our life. And I'm going to tell you, one of the ways you know you're saved is it's going to bother you till you repent of it. That's one of the ways you know you're saved. You can't live with sin in your life and have peace and put your head on the pillow at night and, and, and sleep well. Because the, the, the problem that necessitates revival is sin. Folks, can I tell you in all truth, the church today is really unclean. It is. It's unclean. You want to name the sin? And it's in the lives of some church people. I don't know who they are. God does, though. That's all that really matters. It don't matter if Brother Gary knows. All that matters is God knows. And believe me, God does know. And I think last time I preached on a message, who are you? And you can fool the preacher and you can fool this, that, and that. But you, but you never fool God. And so, sin. We all have sin. Apathy, unconcern, 
And so that's the problem that necessitates revival. All right, let's, uh, let's, let's move along and talk about the pain that precedes revival. The pain that precedes revival. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, it's ironic that he says then, and we might just say parenthetically only then, will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. You know what we got to do with that sin, folks? We got to repent of it. One of the hardest things for us to do is to be honest with ourselves. That was the purpose of the exercise this morning, to help us to be honest. I'm going to tell you, Baptists don't like to be honest. They don't really want to look deep into their heart. And we've got we've to be honest. We've got to look at our lives and look at our hearts and say, Lord, there's some things there that ought not be there. And I'm going to tell you something, we must repent. That's what the pain is. It's, it's painful to repent. Anybody, does anybody enjoy admitting you've got something in your life that's keeping you from being all you want to be? You've done things wrong. Does anybody enjoy confessing that, facing up to that, and then turning from that? Nobody does. Repentance is painful. But it's necessary in order to have revival. I wish I had more time I could share some examples, but, but I just don't. So let me just leave that there. Uh, man, i got a great example I could share, but I, I, I want to get to this. And so the pain that precedes it is repentance. And then lastly, praise God. Look, he says, then will I hear from heaven? That is, if I repent of my sins, what does God say? I will what? Forgive their sin and heal their land. That speaks of the pardon that proceeds from a broken heart. The pardon that proceeds from a broken heart. Now that's a good seven point sermon that uh, some preacher can take and build on that. But uh, I'll just did the skeleton of it tonight. But that's the, that's the seven peas in the pod or whatever you want to call it about revival. But if we'll do that, God says, I will forgive you of your sins. And heal your land. Folks, we need a healing in America. Amen. Man, people at one of those throws. The Democrats hate the Republicans. The Republicans hate the Democrats. It's the biggest mess in my lifetime. And yours. And there are churches that are clashing now too. In different places. Don't let the devil drive a wedge between you and another believer. Do not let it happen. It's not worth it. If you have ought against somebody, you go to them. You share that. If you've done wrong, you ask them to forgive you. If they've wronged you, you tell them they've wronged you. Give them an opportunity to ask you to forgive them. And be reconciled because we have a greater, higher standard than the world does. We are the people of God. And so we can have revival. Okay, everybody got that? I know that was quick and not a lot of detail, but um, I wanted to share that with you. So that's just kind of the theology behind revival. And so what I want to do now is I want to deal with something that God gave me years ago and I think I told you this morning, I used to do this during the church training hour before I preached on Sunday night. But in recent years, I haven't because I'm telling you, it's hard to pour your heart out for two hours straight. But I feel like that God wants me to share this with you tonight. I shared it, the last time I shared this was at my church where I'm a member, where I pastored many years ago. And God used it greatly. And it's, it's practical. It's, as I told you earlier, this will never violate itself. Now, would we all agree, y'all going to discover I'm a great artist? 
Would y'all agree that revival comes from God? Absolutely. Amen. But revival does not depend on God. Are you with me? It comes from God, but it does not depend on God. I promise you, God wants to send revival. He wants to send revival more than anybody in this building wants to receive revival. So what happens when God seeks to send revival? Folks, listen. Revival, do we have anybody can draw? If you do, I want you to come up here and draw me a triangle, a big triangle. I'll draw one, but man, it's going to be the worst looking triangle you've ever seen. Anybody draw? Some of y'all got to have it. Thank you, sweet lady. I, honestly, I just didn't want to embarrass myself. I want you to draw a big triangle and, and leave about that much open at the bottom. Yeah. Start at the top like that. There you go. Okay. Come on. Come, yeah, that's right. Come on down. That's good. Very good. All right, thank you. That's a great job. <laughs> Let me go ahead and put something down at the bottom. You probably can't read it. That says rivers of revival. That's what we need to have. Amen. We need to have a sweeping revival. Now, revival comes from God, does not depend on God. What has to happen? Let's just, let's just boil it down to sweet water. That's us. What has to happen at Sweetwater Baptist Church or any other church for that matter for revival to come? Now, as I understand the New Testament, there are only two offices in scripture pastor and deacon right pastor and deacon okay when God seeks to send revival you know the first thing that's going to happen there's going to be some barriers that the Holy Spirit has to get over and if he can't get over it there won't be revival I promise you the first thing that has to happen is the pastor has to be right with Almighty God. Boy, they, people don't expect the evangelist to come in and start with the preacher, do they? But folks, listen to me. It doesn't matter if it's Brother Wilton or Brother Gary or my pastor or some other pastor. You're not going to have revival in a church until the pastor gets right with God and is right with God. Are y'all listening? Y'all getting quiet? <laughs> That's pretty weak. <laughs> Let me also in this level right here put pastor's wife and also staff. I want to tell you something. I've never been in a, I've never been in a, what I call a revival or a real semblance of where God really moved without the pastor, his wife, and the staff, and their spouses being right with God. It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. I've been to a few churches, not a lot, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. I've been to a few churches that after working with the pastor a couple of days, there ain't no way we're going to have revival. He's not really interested. He's having a revival because some of the church people stayed on him to have, have some meetings and all that. Folks, you talk about frustration for an evangelist. There's a lot of things an evangelist can do when he comes into a church he can preach on. But I'm not real comfortable standing up saying, hey, folks, y'all ought to fire your preacher this week. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that because that's not what God's called me to do. But they've been, they've been a handful of places over the years. I felt like telling folks that. I mean, I didn't sense a spiritual bone in their body.
I, I've done two revivals for a certain pastor. And in one of them, his wife never came to a single service. She had a sour attitude. I mean, she, she was bitter about everything, complained about everything. There was a sense I felt kind of sorry for him, but he ought to be the head of his house and straighten that deal out. She, I think, got treated bad in a previous church, and she turned every church off. That's stupid. Excuse that word. It's dumb. And then staff. You know, we're going to have revival. Brother Larry's got to be right with God. Y'all know that? Where's your youth man? Where? Okay, brother. What else staff you got? Children? Where's children? Amen. You, you guys got to be right with God. Amen. You do. That's just the way it is. I pastored, well, it was the last church I pastored. I had a very talented minister of music. And he had a great voice. What was that, a baritone voice, honey? And, and he'd be up singing, and his wife would sit back there, and she'd pull on her ear because she thought he was a little bit too loud. And she'd pull, that's the funniest thing I've ever seen. But anyway, all of a sudden, I noticed that there just seemed to be something different. You know, he just didn't seem, uh, my spirit didn't witness with him like it had previously. And so we had a revival meeting. And thank God for, the, I had an evangelist in. Thank God for evangelists. They, most of them are good godly men, misunderstood sometimes, but he came in on Sunday morning, and man, he preached. Down the aisle comes my minister of music. Get on his knees, cried like a baby, and then came and apologized to me. I don't know what I did to him or what he thought I did to him, but he got right with God, and I appreciate that. And we had revival. You just feel the Spirit of God move. There's a pastor I've done several revivals with. Brother Wilton would know him if I called his name. And uh, one of the revivals I did with him, I told him, I said, uh, there's something wrong here. As an evangelist, you can, if you, in a lot of, you, you can tell when there's a hindrance, when there's a barrier, something's keeping God from moving. I said, there's something wrong in your church. There's, there's a reason that God's not moving in this revival. I said that repeatedly. We had a few things happen. I get home, and about two months later, I get a four-page handwritten letter from this pastor. He said, I found out where the blockage was to revival. It was my minister of youth. He was carrying on with a teenage girl. I started to say that's what they make trees for. Put limbs on somebody. I better not say that. That just gives me a pain I can't locate, though. But folks, I'm going to tell you something. God sends revival. Comes from God. First thing's got to happen. The pastor, his wife, staff, and their spouses have to be right with God. What you notice about a triangle? What you notice about a triangle, as it comes down that triangle, this gets wider and wider and wider, right? That symbolizes the Spirit of God beginning to move more and more and more. All right? Once we get these right with God, there's another group in a church that has to be right with God. Anybody want to guess? Somebody said deacons. That's exactly right. Lest I forget it. In my opinion, and everybody's got one, in the places I've been, 1,200, 1,400 churches, ever how many I've been in, I would say this is at least 75% of the blockage right here. I could guess at some of the deacons. I, you know, I don't, I don't know. But I think I probably told you on a previous occasion, the most godly man I've ever known was a Baptist deacon. Whatever I am in the Lord, I owe a lot of it to him. But folks, you cannot have revival unless the deacons are sold out for it and supported. 
and committed to it and lead out in it. Lead out in it. Y'all get ready to have another revival. You deacons ought to come along and tell Brother Wilton, let us lead out in revival. Let us lead out in the prayer meetings. And uh, that's in my revival preparation material. Deacons holding prayer meetings in their home and leading out it with a short devotional and then praying. Deacons have got to do that because you supposed to be the most spiritual men in your church lay people and you've got to lead people brother wilson doesn't need to look up on wednesday night and wonder where his deacons are or sunday night and wonder where his deacons are i can tell you for a fact that an average baptist well of course a lot of them not even having sunday night anymore man we let covid do a number on us didn't we y'all keep having sunday night service praise god but in most churches, man, they were thrilled to death with no Sunday night service. As, or, or even come on Wednesday night. I tell you, in my young brass days, you know what I used to do on Sunday night? I'd get the list of deacons, I'd call the roll. I'd call the roll. I'm leaving in a few days, so what do <laughs> Amen. Seriously, we need men of God who will be faithful. We need deacons who will be faithful. We need deacons who will lead out. We need deacons who have been set apart. They've been ordained. They're men of God. I'm going to tell you, deacons are critical to the lifeblood of a church. By the way, how many of you are deacons, by the way? Let me see who you are. I don't even know. I've been here a bunch of times. I didn't even see anybody. Well, you know, those of you got your hands up, I see y'all every time I come. That's good. Hallelujah. I don't, I don't know how many others you got, Brother Wilson, but thank God you got these. But I, you probably got some some at the house watching television tonight. <laughs> y'all got that, didn't you? I've done a couple revivals. First Baptist Church, Slaughter, Louisiana. Y'all know where Slaughter is outside of Baton Rouge? Pastor's only been there 50-something years, long time. We rode the same school bus. Uh, he and his twin brother, his twin brother just died. Tebow and, or Thomas and Basil Wicker. But anyway, one of the revivals I did at um, Brother Basil's church, First Baptist Slaughter, I shared this. And then I preached behind that. And during the invitation in the service, I noticed one of the men. I didn't know who the deacons were. I noticed one of the men going here and 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 here to other men in the church. And then they all came together and they got on their knees here at the front and had a prayer meeting during the invitation. And then they stood across the front and that one going here and here and here and here was the chairman of the deacons. And I'll never forget what he said. He stood up. And these men had been weeping literally. He stood up and he said, folks, we as a body of deacons or whatever he, term he used to describe them, he said, we have not been what we ought to have been. We have failed you. And we have gotten on our knees and we've asked God to forgive us for not fulfilling our commitments to him and to you. And we stand before you as the group of deacons and we want to ask you to forgive us for not fulfilling our duty. Now folks, you think revival came? You better believe it did. But let me tell you something. I don't even remember that man's name. It's been so many years. But I'm going to tell you that took a real man of God. And all those others that came with him that stood across, that took real men of God. That's what real men of God do. I told a friend of mine on Facebook, he had put a post on about something, and he was kind of teary-eyed. I said, it's all right for men to weep. Real men cry once in a while. Amen. We ought to cry about the condition of our country, our communities, our families. We need to cry over some things. But let me tell you something. When you got a church, it gets leadership from here to here. Y'all see what's happening? 
that revival is growing. All right, we got another level to go. Anybody want to guess what that might be? We got the, we got the pastor and the staff and their families right. We got all the deacons. And, and, and I'd put, listen, I'd put deacons' wives here too. Don't think I left you off. I could spend 30 more minutes talking about that, but I don't have time. All right, this is Sunday school. Sunday school and church training. Is that what they call it now? Discipleship training used to be church training. It used to be BTU before that. Some of y'all remember them days? Man, I'd go back a long time. Whatever they call it. They always, Southern Baptists always changing the name. They don't change the name of D.O. Williams again. By the time you learn what they're supposed to be called, they give them, call them something else. They're associational mission strategists. But they're not doing mission. They're not doing evangelism. Anyway. <laughs> Sunday school teachers and church training teachers and leaders. Can't have a great church without great Sunday school teachers, Bible teachers, church training teachers. Can't do it. Can't get it all in a, in a sermon, as I said this morning. Can't get it all even in that area. It's got to be, be at home, too, but... That's all some get. And you've got to have great Sunday school teachers. I may have told you on a previous occasion, a number of times in a revival, I had little boys and little girls come up to me, look at me at those innocent eyes. And you know something, folks? You'd be amazed at how they listen. I was telling Brother Wilton over lunch today, teenagers, I, even at my age, I still speak to a lot of kids. You know what? They'll listen to the truth. They know you're telling them the truth, and they will respond. But this preacher talk and this junk, forget about it. They'll turn you off in a second because they know when you're telling them the truth, and they need to hear the truth and want to hear the truth. But I'd have it come out with a little insight. I'd say, Brother Gary, can I ask you a question? I'd say, what is it, sweetheart? Brother Gary, where's Mr. So-and-so, my Sunday school teacher or my deacon? Or preacher, where's Miss So-and-so, my Sunday school teacher on, on Sunday night or Wednesday night? You see, that deacon, that Sunday school teacher, they come Sunday morning, teach their class, come back next Sunday morning. Many of them didn't come back Sunday night, and a whole bunch of them didn't come Wednesday night. Little boys and little girls are asking their pastors and their others in the church, why doesn't our leaders support our church? Can y'all give me that? Can you give me a good answer on why deacons can't be faithful and Sunday school teachers can't be faithful? Can I, can I be honest with you? Can I tell you why they're not? They can make every excuse in the book. But the real reason is they're just not right with God. They're just not right with God. Because last time I checked, we do what we want to do. We do what we want to do. Alabama Crimson Tide, I... Love Alabama, but I don't like the Crimson Tide. <laughs> and the tide is turning. <laughs> but listen to me, seriously. We joke about that kind of stuff. It's so Im unimportant. It has no, it, it doesn't really, amen? amen? Baseball season's coming. Y'all know we was number one. Y'all didn't know that. <laughs> I'm, basketball, that, not worried about that one. That's going to have to be later. But, but seriously, folks, we can't have revival unless we're in this thing together. Amen. It's got to be, there's got to be unity. There's got to be a, a sweet spirit for God to bless. Sunday school, church training. And then down here is some of you are saying, preacher, tell them. Man, preacher, tell those deacons, tell those Sunday school teachers and 
This is others. This is everybody else. Did you know the same scripture that a pastor reads and a deacon reads, the lay people are reading? Same things that God requires of them, he requires of the rest of us, except in certain particular areas of ministry. But as far as our heart, our commitment level, and all the rest, a lay person, a saved lay person, ought to be as committed as the pastor, as the deacons, as the others. Amen. It's the rest of us. And so, revival comes from God. It starts at the top. It's got to come through the deacons, the teachers, others. And let me tell you something. By the time it gets right along here, if it breaks those barriers, I'm telling you, folks are going to get caught up in revival whether they want to or not. It's just going to overwhelm them. And then you get down here to the rivers of revival. I've been in a handful of those kind in my ministry. Not enough. I long for more. I'm telling you, folks, it'll ruin you if you ever see revival. You can't go back to same old, same old anymore. Now, folks, this will never be violated. I can promise you 50 years of preaching the gospel stands to tell you that that principle will never be violated. The principle of the triangle, starting with leadership and working down that triangle, it'll never be violated. I can't name you one place that it'll ever be violated. Wherever you are in the triangle, it's just as important for others to get right with God as it is the pastor, the staff, the deacons, the Sunday school, church training teachers, other leaders. It's just as important for everybody else to be right with God. Well, folks, that's pretty much it. But I do want to ask you, do you have any questions? I will entertain questions. I know this is kind of a little bit different, but I just felt led to share this with you because I... God blessed it so much at my church, I guess the year before last night, maybe, maybe it was last year, whenever it was. It really spoke to our people. Anybody have any questions? No questions? Scared to answer? Ask? I want to see revival. Do you? Amen. Amen. More than anything, I want to see revival. I hope I get to see it before the Lord takes me to glory one way or the other. Because I got children and I got grandchildren. And maybe one day if Jesus tears, I'll have great-grandchildren. I won't know them until I get to heaven because my two grandsons are 12 and 13. And I doubt I'm going to make it that long till they get married and have kids. But who knows? Who knows? I may live to be 90 years old if Jesus tarries. But I doubt it. I won't see revival. Amen. Can I share a personal note? I sure do love and appreciate you, Sweetwater. I really do. More than you know, I appreciate you preaching. Let me ask you to pray for him every single day. You have no idea the load that a pastor carries. Because he loves people, he carries burdens of the people. And you've got a great man of God and a great pastor leading you. I hope you realize that. If he were to leave, for example, and go somewhere else, and you started looking, you're going to say, oh, my gosh, we didn't realize what we had. Amen? Y'all seem to have a great staff. Man, I'm telling you, Brother Larry, this music. I told Brother Wilton, the choir was saying, I said, man, that's almost non-existent now. There ain't nothing better than a good choir. It blesses me when I come. I probably need to be paying y'all to let me come. <laughs> but it wouldn't be much. <laughs> but I want you to know I love you and I appreciate you. And I, Would y'all pray for me? I want you to pray for me. The old devil tells me, Gary, you're getting old. Man, you done lost most of your hair. 
you done got fat, and you've always been ugly. <laughs> you might as well just hang it up. Folks, I don't want to hang it up. As long as I got some strength in my body and my halfway rightful mind, I want to keep preaching the gospel of Jesus. So would y'all pray for me as you get through praying with Brother Wilson, pray for me. I look forward to coming back in March and uh, hearing some great preaching because there's some great preachers coming. I know, I think I know all of them but one, and I know of him, and he's a Jim Dandy preacher. And so I'm looking forward to, well, there's two that I don't really know. I know of the two. And I, look, I got to looking at that, and I don't know if there's any message on that, but, and I looked up the age of the one that I thought was around my age, and I'm older than him. I don't know what that says. <laughs> but anyway, pray this week for me, as Brother Wilson mentioned. Please pray. I want to preach exactly what God lays on my heart to preach, and that should be. Pray for these other men of God. You're going to be blessed because, of course, some of them you've had here, and you know that, but some you haven't. It's going to bless you like everything. Okay, let's stand together. I hope this has meant something to you and take this home with you and think about it because it's just really the way it is. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather in your house again tonight. We thank you for the reminder of 2 Chronicles 7, 14. I pray, Lord, that its familiarity does not dim its message to our hearts. We've heard it so much that Sometimes we can say, oh, I know all about that, and we just kind of turn it off. But, Lord, there's so much there. And I just hit the mountain peaks of it tonight in the few minutes I dealt with it. And, God, I pray that we would take this triangle seriously and the flow of revival that it represents. And, God, I pray that you'll help us to be instruments of revival. I pray, God, you'll help us to be humble people. And, God, I realize that, and I confess that I'm proud sometimes. That's not anything to be proud of because it's sin, it's wickedness. But God, I want you to cleanse my heart. I want you to forgive me. I want you to help me be what I should be. Lord, I pray for my dear brother Wilson. Precious, precious friend and brother what a blessing he's been to me for many many years now he's trusted me to come to his churches and, and preach many 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 times God I'm so grateful God I thank you for brother Larry and these instrumentalists and these other staff members God I pray you'll bless them and I pray you'll anoint them and I pray you'll use them mightily God, I thank you for the membership, the lay people of Sweetwater Baptist Church who have a sweet spirit and who I believe the vast majority love you, love you wholeheartedly and want to be the individuals and the families and the church that you'd have them to be. And I pray for them, Lord, and I'll continue to pray for them. Because I have fondness in my heart for this congregation. So, Father, I ask you to bless. As we come this time of invitation, Lord, if there's somebody here that